Folks, welcome back to So Bad It's Good, presented by Betches Media. Today, you guys, is a banner day for me in this show. We have a guest I have loved from the moment I saw him on Best Week Ever, and since then, he has created or been a part of so many TV shows, The League, 30 Rock, Black Monday, Human Giant, Film, The Disaster Artist, Pop Star, and Podcasts, How Did This Get Made, that have brought a smile to my face day in, day out. Well, this man now has a book, which you need to order right now, called Joyful Recollections of Trauma. This book is hysterically funny. It is a love letter to growing up with and being shaped by pop culture, but also surprisingly touching in moments about his stepdad, his now wife, June Diane Raphael, and being a father. Uh, You guys, it is hella cool to have our guest today, Paul Shear. Paul, welcome to the show. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And now I have to live up to this introduction. I, I, you know, look, I, I feel very good about myself. I should have uh, you introduced me every day just to get me yeah. my day started right. Well, it was good talk to you. Good talk to right. you, Paul. Thanks we'll so much. Bye-bye. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I read this book with my own eyes. I'm in like an audio I am book. amazed and I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what I want to tell the audience, though, is that this book, you're going to pick it up and you're going to burn through this. I was laughing from the fr- I, I was laughing at the intro when you compare the Mary Lou Henner memory uh, bit because- <laughs> A lot of people don't know Mary Lou Henner has like this photographic memory. She can remember any day, any time. She can tell you what she was wearing. It's it's yeah. frightening. And and it's not bullshit either. It's like she's not, you know, you you can't get a, you're not getting a prize for remembering the past. Like she's like, oh yeah, no, I wore a, a blue blouse that day with red shoes. And then they pull up a picture. It's like, oh yeah, she's wearing a blue blouse with red yeah. shoes. I, um, uh, I, I kind of was blown away by this because uh, I felt like, You speak for a lot of people like me that, I mean, I grew up in Kansas, like pop culture and movies like meant the world to me. And we we share a brotherhood because I too worked at Blockbuster Video like you did. And I I don't know, like people don't, I I tell people that they had to cut a piece of my hair for a drug test and everybody thinks I make that up. But you talk about that in this book. I'm so happy to hear you say that too. Well, first of all, I think, you know, in writing this book, and talking about Blockbuster Video, it's a really interesting thing because in this moment now, it's like, well, what's a video store? Why is that important? Why would you want to be there? But to me, it was it really was like the coolest job you could get. Now, I will say Quentin Tarantino did come on unspooled <laughs> and make fun of me. He's like, oh, you work for the enemy. And I get it. But yeah. we didn't have cool video stores like no. that. I, I, you know, this is the best I could do. I mean, that was – oh, you cut out for a sec there. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You kind of, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll edit that. Right. Uh, no, you're right. I mean, Tarantino was that guy that like worked at the video store, but he worked at that one, what is it, like in Long Beach or something like yeah. that? And Blockbuster was like the Michael Bay of video stores, but it felt like I had a foothold into the industry when I worked there. It was so great. It was such a fun place to work. And I, you know, that was my first job. And just to go back to the the haircutting of it all, I just thought that was something that happened at every job. Like they would cut your hair for drugs. Like, you know, and, and, you know, we're working at Blockbuster, you know, we're, we shouldn't be taking drug tests that actively. Right. I mean, it seems like if you're working in the military government, need drug tests, but we're just, we're slinging videotapes here. Yeah. I mean, I like the DNA of it all. I was like, wow, they have like a whole Blockbuster lab that is processing hair samples. And <laughs> only years later did I realize that that was really off. But that was like a power. Like I felt so powerful working there. And you talk about wanting to be on the floor at Blockbuster around the people, around the films. And I was stuck behind the counter and I got really snobby. If I didn't like the film that somebody was renting, I would say, enjoy your movie. But if I respected them, I would say, enjoy your film. You see, oh, I like that. I like that. I mean, it's so subtle. And that, and that is really, like, that is really the perfect articulation of the kind of nerds that we are. Like, I mean, truly, like, like, it, like, yeah. Oh, I just slammed that person so hard. But it was, you know, you felt, you know, it, it's, there was something so fun about going home with a movie that you had no idea what it was. Like, for me, it was like, I like Tim Roth. He was in Reservoir Dogs. So I'm going to rent this movie called Jumping at the Boneyard. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to rent it. And, you know, and that was like you you saw so much more stuff because you just had to take a chance. There was no letterbox. You couldn't Google it. Like I talk about this moment where Natalie Portman comes into our store 
And I'm like, that is Natalie Portman. And now at this point, this is Natalie Portman from The Professional. Although in yeah. the book, they made me call it by the, the Le- official Leon, name that it is Leon now. The professional. <laughs> I was like, well, it was called The Professional when I, whatever. But, uh, you know, and I only knew her from that. Like, I knew that that was uh, Matilda. And, uh, but I was like, oh my gosh, that's Matilda. And, you know, like, no, her name is Natalie Herschlag. And I was like, I was like, oh, Herschlag, like that feel, maybe it's a stage name, but I couldn't know. There was no yes. way to, to, to find out a stage name. You know, so I, for years I lived with thinking it was Natalie Portman. Now I found out it was. I mean, like you, you were even, you need, uh, you name dropped the red, white, and, uh, uh, the red, white, and blue trilogy oh, yeah, Kis- in there. Uh, Kizoski, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know about him until I worked at Blockbuster and like, I think we're the same age. So that yeah. you speak to such a time and place that I just felt, wow, like it blew me away. But to go back, I jumped ahead. What, what made you even want to write a book? And by the way, now after reading this, I want another book immediately. Oh my gosh. What, <laughs> what was the, what was the inspiration to actually put these stories down? Well, first of all, let me just say uh, thank you for reading it again, just because it's so new. Um, the book just, you know, I just kind of finished it. You know, I've been tweaking it for the last couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, you really are one of the handful of people who read it. So it's lovely to 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 hear this response. Um, you know, it started with How Did This Get Made, which is a podcast I do with Jason Manzukis and June Diane Raphael. Geostorm! And- Geostorm! <laughs> By the way, the one of the biggest uh, regrets I have it just happened last week. I was at South by Southwest, and we won a uh, a podcast award. We won the uh, iHeart Heart. Uh, uh, Best TV and Film Podcast Award, and I was very surprised to win it. So much so that I was doing a bit about losing and storming the stage before they announced my name. I was hanging out with the, the guys from Workaholics because, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then they called us. Like, oh, and, and I, and I missed my moment to get on that stage and yell, Geostorm! <laughs> I would have, and I kicked myself for the rest of the night that I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, but yeah, we do this podcast about bad movies. Uh, we love bad movies. We love, and not even bad movies. It's not like, we just love movies, popcorn movies. Like the beekeeper is prime cinema for me, you know, fast <laughs> and furious. Like we, we, we get into it and there really is a love for these films. It's, so we talk about these movies, but oftentimes in those conversations, you know, like I have this, we were talking about this movie, Milk Money. And <laughs> in the middle of the Milk Money episode, I remembered that I once went in to New York City to go see a naked woman like the characters from this movie. <laughs> and I hadn't thought about that in years. And, and that came out and we started talking about it. They were asking me questions about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, like that's kind of a crazy story. And for the last 14 years, that's kind of what has been happening. These like funny stories pop out, these like little remnants of real life situations. And everyone's like, oh, you should write a book. You should write a book. And I was like, that's, yes, I would love to. But I also know the want to write a book and actually writing a book are different. And I didn't want to just, write a book that was just going to be like anecdotes, you know, like, which yeah. I think would be fun. And, and so I started just to write and kind of found this larger story. Cause this is like a, a, a part of my life kind of about me growing up in this kind of fucked up situation and then kind of figuring out who I wanted to be and how I wanted to live in this world and eventually become a parent myself. So that's like the, that's like the spine. And then there's a bunch of funny stories hanging off that spine. Yeah, I mean, that's the foundation, which I actually was really impressed by because I've laughed with you so much, but there were times where I would tear up at like a, a, something that you had said or, oh, or your perspective on life or even like delving into therapy or even like I, it was hard to imagine you uh, as an angry young man at times as somebody getting into fights like that was. <laughs> and there's a really great uh, story in the book, you know, where where one day you said, you know what, this isn't me. I'm going to I'm going to back away from this fight. Hey, man, I'm sorry. I overreacted. And I thought. That really takes a lot for a man to actually admit that, but it was even so hard for me to picture you like that. You know, it's so interesting. We we change so much. I, I grew up in Long Island, and you know, Long Island is it's interesting. I love Long Island. I wanted to leave Long Island as soon as I have a well, I should say I have a love hate relationship with it. Right? There are things about it that I really love, and there are things about it I really don't like, and um. I think it was always like kind of wrestling with these two personalities. I was surrounded by a bunch of just aggro dudes. Like that was the way that you solved your shit, you know? And it wasn't, it wasn't even like, oh, I'm more aggressive than most. It was like, no, I, this is the way it goes. I I went back to my old house. I hadn't gone back to my old house in decades. And I was at home 
visiting my dad a different home. And I was like, I'm going to go by there. And I drove by there and I tell a story about a 7-Eleven. I stopped at that 7-Eleven <laughs> too. And, um, and as I, as I went into that 7-Eleven, I saw these guys that I write about in my book. Like it was so crazy. I saw these guys in these camo pants, you know, f- with a fucking knife on their hip, like, you know, a, And like the minute I walked in there, it was like, goddamn Biden. And it was like, wow. It was like, I literally walked into like a sketch of what I think this uh, world is, you know? Um, And, you know, so it was always like, there were fights and I want, and I was like, I was a little bit of um, a baller. Like, I'm not baller, like a brawler. Uh, And And a baller. Yeah. Yeah. And a a baller. baller. Yeah. Baller and a brawler, you know, and it just, and I never really thought that much about it. And I think, you know, sometimes it was like that anger that I had. It was like, I know this is wrong. I know this is like, I, I, it didn't feel right, but I didn't know why it didn't feel right. And that was kind of like, you know, a part of the book is like about like just putting that in a box and going like, I'll deal with that later. Like, you know, but I didn't know what it was. It's not, it didn't go anywhere. It's still there. It's still in the house. It just is like, but I was like, ah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it was sort of like trying to figure that stuff out and, and yeah, just like learn how to have real emotions and, and not get rid of anger, but just kind of balance it. Yeah. We know. Um, and we had talked about just briefly before we started recording about that quiet on set, the docuseries on Nickelodeon. And it, you know, I was, I was reading your book and thinking about how often as kids, we just kind of like okay, I guess that's the way the world works, you know, or even dealing with your stepdad or even, you know, your parents divorcing and they still live together for many, many years. Yeah, like three years. Yeah, three three years. Three years. Your dad would show up at 6 a.m. and there's a story about you, you know, seeing him not in his bed asleep and it totally wigged you out, but you kind of just went along. You accepted that. Yeah, I think, you know, as kids, we we really – we really just kind of go like this, like this is the world. The world is only as wide as you open the doors to it, right? As parents, I've noticed that now with my kids, like it was, um, you know, and you forget sometimes how much they don't know. Like my, my kid came home the other day and said to me, he was like, really serious. He's like, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's nine years old. And he's like, you know about the Holocaust? Oh. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, I do. He's like, that was pretty awful. I was like, yes, <laughs> like, right. It's like, you know, it's like, I'm like, oh, of course, like my son doesn't know about like, yes. you know, and like, right. It's like, but like, and of course you're going to learn. And I didn't, there was a, but like, this is this thing, like you don't know. And then the world starts to slowly open up to you and you start to be like, oh, right. This is this. And this is that. And, you know, I think Long Island kind of kept those blinders uh, even shut a little bit more, you know, like we're, with yeah. my kid, I'm like, we sat down, we had a very intense conversation about it. We really got into details because you never know when to bring yeah. up certain things and you know, and, uh, you know, and I will say that he said it with as much gravitas as he said to me the following week, Jack Black is Kung Fu Panda. Why didn't you tell me that? I was like, I didn't know I was keeping that a secret. So, uh, <laughs> well, I sat him down and, I- <laughs> <laughs> and we had a very, another very serious conversation, but it was, uh, you know, it's sort of like this thing of, you know, if your parents aren't bringing you in, you kind of, you start to figure out stuff by yourself and some of the stuff that you figure out by yourself is wrong you know i mean my yeah. my knowledge of like what sex was was so you know off you bring kilter. that up in the book about yeah. what you thought like a blowjob was and I, I was talking to the audience last week about like my dad my mom having to make my dad give me the birds and bees talk and all it, it consisted of was do you know what's going on and i was like i totally do and i didn't know anything i had no right. clue but i didn't even, i knew this situation was awkward for the both of us so i just said yeah i know everything i knew nothing no, and it's so hard. And look, it, like as a parent, as we like, I have a ten-year-old, I have an almost ten-year-old and a seven-year-old. I'm walking these lines, right? Because it's like I always want to be like, how much do you need to know? But also, I want to make sure that you feel like you can. Like we're just we're figuring it out. We're figuring it out, right? And um, you know, but but I think our parents were a lot less revealing. Like June's dad, my wife's dad, drew underpants on all the anatomy models in like an <laughs> anatomy book. <laughs> You know, and it's like, you know, so there is that kind of stuff where you're like, oh, right. They were so like, I never had that talk of the birds and the bees or whatever. You know, it's like, it was only, everything was viewed as like, you're going to get somebody pregnant. It was like, 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 I felt like if I had an, if I kissed somebody too intently, that's it. They're going to get pregnant. Like I didn't know. I didn't know. Like there didn't seem to be any protection from being pregnant. 
And then even as a kid, you're like trying to get scrambled like Skinamax movies of like yes. when you see a boob or something. You're even talking about blockbuster people coming in for adult films. And I was like, the, the hardest we had was like Shannon Tweed, William Cat films. Oh, yeah. Two uh, Junction, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. little Sherilyn Fenn. Yeah, all that. Yes, it was always like the same ones. But I, I, I found that so endearing. And I think so many of us grow up that same way. So it was refreshing to hear you talk about that. And also you talk about relationships in this book, even, you know, with girls is that you had been through a, a series of relationships that didn't end well. And, you know, even going into your marriage with, with June yeah. and your relationship, I found that interesting, too, of being introspective of like, well, maybe I'm the problem here. Maybe I have to look at that. Yeah, you know, look, I, I felt like my relationships were running a similar course and I couldn't figure out what that was. I think part of it was I was attracted to certain people that were give me that were maybe a little bit more emotional or uh, emotionally yeah. cut off. Right. Yes. You know, but then also, why was I going to those people? I remember there was one girl. I, I didn't put this in the book. I should have. Book two. But, uh, Here we go. Book uh, yeah. two. But uh, yeah, like they, move like, over, she... Mark Maron. I'm going to get the I'm going to get the acknowledgement at this. You get in there. You know, yeah. what's uh, the uh, the that like she said, I'm going to put a you know, you have a post-it note on you. As like you need to fix that about yourself. She get like she and I, I remember like thing like and like it was like this idea like I saw myself through her eyes as like a person that had all these post it notes like it's almost like fix this problem here like like notes that you would leave around your house like to be yeah. like oh yeah plumbing's busted don't touch that this is the internet code and I just remember like like thinking about oh I'm like a fucking busted device to this person like i'm like i have a post-it note on my soul like you know um and you know and so it was when we when i broke up with my last girlfriend it was sort of like it was that moment i don't know if you've had this but when you break up with somebody that you're like oh i was going to spend my life with them but at the same time you're like thank god i didn't right yeah. and it's like when you realize that like oh i could have made this horrible choice uh, 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 that wouldn't have been good for me. Not that the person was bad or whatever, but like that was like the real crossroads I had. It was like, I was really lamenting being out of a relationship that I didn't want to be in, but I was like, but why? Like, but I just didn't want to lose either. Yeah, like, you would you know, have accepted it. You would have yeah. accepted being there. You would have never gotten out of it potentially. And I found that like a similar theme, even with growing up with your parents and yeah. your stepdad, you know, like not knowing that these things were kind of like that you actually had a stake in this as well. And then um, you could actually do something about it. I think that that's kind of like the, the trick with all of this. I mean, even what we're doing right now with podcasting, it's like, you know, this is our opportunity to go make and do without anybody telling us what to do like you know we live in a world yeah. where it's like you want to get a tv show on the air like all right well th see in three years like you know if we if you're that lucky right and then you spend three years working on something and so many things don't go forward and it's like this it's about like try to take some control in your own lives like, creatively and you know emotionally all these things it's important to like to yeah. grab it yeah and that's what I say. This is all a celebration of that, this book, you guys. And it also kind of reminded me in a certain way of uh, I've been listening to a lot of David Sedaris lately. Oh, I love it. There's David a little Sedaris. bit of a David Sedaris quality with some of these things that I felt like, man, this is such a great like this is the start. And I hope we continue oh. on with this. Um, You've made my day. I mean, like David Sedaris to me is so amazing. And I, I loved writing. It's like it's so fun to to write, you know, and, and like and sit and it's like and you know, for me, it's so permanent too. Like, you know, like, like letting this book go was hard, right? Cause it's like, well, I want to add something in. Or, like I was adding stuff in on this last pass that I did in June. My wife was like, stop it. Take all that stuff out. Just stop. And it, cause it's like, you, you know, it's going to be like locked in amber on some level. And you're like, I yeah. hope I'm saying the right thing here. I won't let it say this, but it, it, it's such a fun thing to do. And, and, uh, you know, for those of you who don't like to. This book is training AI for future Paul Shear. Oh, by the, the way. AI uh, Paul Shear uh, will yes. be this book. I mean, and so funny because already, I guess, um, when the book was first announced, it's it's sold enough that it, it has spawned enough AI copies, like eight or nine AI copies of my book. So if you go on Amazon and you type in like Paul Shear book, enjoy it. Enjoy what you will see <laughs> because it is the wit and wisdom of Paul Shear, a comedian's journey, Paul Shear's <laughs> view of life. It's these 40 page AI generated books. And there's a hilarious part in one of them. I bought one. I think it's right here. I got it right here. This is it. Um, 
This is uh this is my favorite one. Oh wow, you look amazing. I look like I'm a in a, in a romance novel. <laughs> um, this one is called The Wit and Wisdom, uh, Paul Shear colon a uh, comedic journey. Um, and my friends uh, who I did a bunch of stuff with, Rob Hubel, um, oh, for whatever God. reason, I think that they just trained AI to change um, uh, common verbs. So Rob, they thought it was like Rob, like I'm stealing something. So they call him like. Oh, loot Hubel, steal <laughs> Hubel, uh, multiple times, uh, different adjectives for Rob, uh, uh, <laughs> which is hilarious. But it's a great uh, forty-page read. <laughs> I, I'll pick. I'll pick that up as well. Um, so <laughs> I. Uh, I know I'm hopping all over the place, but I really am so excited. Uh, You you just brought up imagination. And even from a kid, as a kid, you were, you know, that was something that was always strong in you, your imagination. And I always thought it was fascinating that you were able to follow the path you did because only years later, do you realize what a gamble, what a lottery, what, like how insane it is. And you, you know, like, obviously we're insanely talented, but you were like, right. Like you talking about UCB and watching ASCAT for the first time and being a little bit of the, you know, like seeing a lot of improv here in Los Angeles, but you were there with those core four, like almost comparing it to like a punk rock scene, but you were like with like short form improv and you got to see these people doing this thing that immediately, like you had to start taking classes. It was truly amazing. Like, you know, New York city is a huge stand-up city, right? Like it, it, they have great, great stand-up. Um, and I knew I wanted to do comedy, but like, for whatever reason, like I it was like, I never really got into stand-up I, or I, I didn't ever want to go down that path. And I'm so thankful I didn't because I had to find different ways to do comedy. And part of that was improv and doing the short form improv that you might see on like, whose line is it anyway? Just very quick, like yeah. fill in the blank, do this, do that. And I thought it was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This blows my mind. And then when our, some friends were like, let's go see this group, the Upright Citizens Brigade. I went to this five floor walk up uh, above a, an abandoned hardware store, you know, that looked like you were about to get murdered. It was like a wooden staircase. I've never walked up a wooden, uh, like a wooden staircase, to five flights. And I went into this space that was like, that sat maybe like 50 people. And it blew my mind what these guys did. They just performed. And they were not famous at this point. They had just gotten to New York City. They were trying to find a place to perform. And they found this like weird little loft space. And it was free to go to, but $5 to leave, uh, which was a great, <laughs> uh, a great way to get you in. And it was like, whoa, this is comedy. Like This felt to me like I loved what I did at Chicago Soon Lights. It was funny. And but you were like, getting paid to do it too. I was getting paid to tour you around the country. You left a paying do... job, yeah. I left a paying job to chase long form improv because it felt like this is Mr. Show. This is Miss... This is Ben Stiller Show. This it just felt adult, electric, alive, and to see these people because you know back in the the day, there's so much stuff I cut out, but like you know I was watching Tina Fey, Rachel Dratch, Adam McKay all perform with the UCB4 because they were like, oh, we're from Chicago. Our friends are writing on Saturday Night Live. They're going to come play with us. And we're just going to do like a loose long form uh, on a Sunday night. And it was like, and Adam McKay was nobody at that point. He was just a writer on SNL. And it was so funny because I was with my my girlfriend at the time and we went to the Bronx Zoo and I saw Adam McKay with his kids. And I was like, oh, that's that's a guy from NSK. I want to say hi. But I was so nervous to say hi to Adam McKay. But at that point, I'm sure no one was recognizing Adam McKay. I only knew him from ASCAP. You know, um, so it was like a really great moment in the city where all of a sudden all these great people were coming to UCB, going, you know, we were, and again, this is in a five floor walk up that then went to like a porn theater that then went under, uh, under a Gristides. Like, and you would have the craziest people just pop in. Um, you know, I don't, know if this is in there, but I, I may have cut this out, but there was a moment where I was seeing ASCAT and Heather Donahue, who was the star of Blair Witch Project, was going to do monologues. But just to put this in perspective, at that point, there was a debate. Is Blair Witch Project real? Right? <laughs> People didn't know. It was like, this was the first of that <laughs> thing. So when they introduced Heather Donahue to come out to do monologues, People freaked the fuck out. They were like, she's <laughs> dead. 
this is a dead part. Like people didn't know <laughs> what to do. And I remember like she had to be escorted, but she had security because wherever she went at that point, it was like a fucking madhouse. Yeah. And she had, they, and like people were like reaching out to her. Like she was like Michael Jackson or like Harry Styles. Like, Oh, we need you. You know, I was like, it was, you know, but you were seeing these moments because, UCB was a cool place to show. They were, it wasn't like, you know, there was no internet. There was nothing leaking. It wasn't no Instagram. Like, people weren't yeah. putting it. It was like, oh, you were there. Like, Mike Myers played with uh, my group, Respecto Montalban. He just yeah. like, played with us. And no one, like, there was nothing there to advertise. You just were there or you weren't there. And that was it. And it was like, that idea was so much fun. That's the one thing I was reading this book too, is that I was like, you feel like you never talk about it, but it feels like you must have nerves of steel because you knew all of these people. You were such a fan of all of this stuff, Oh yeah. but it never like, cause I, like sometimes I fall apart when I really love, like, I was like, Oh, I might fall apart for this interview with you today. Gosh. And like, it seemed like, but like Mike Myers, you're up there with this dude that like shaped comedy SNL, all of this oh, stuff. Yeah. Like you were just, you were just like playing. You were like a kid in a candy store when that stuff happened. Well, look always frightened out of my mind right like you know whenever like we i do a show right now here in los angeles called dinosaur and we play with which by the way you do of, another show april 20th right yes uh, it, yeah right? yeah 420 yeah so we have like at, uh, yeah, yeah largo. At, at largo at the largo and uh you know and, and so fun is like you you bump into these people like adam sandler came to work out uh some material he was taping a new special um and or he's getting ready to tape a special and he came and he's off to the side of the stage waiting to go on after our improv show and i never met adam sandler before and you're just meeting these people for the first time that you're a f i mean to me it's like adam sandler is like oh my god like he's one of one of the greats you know truly like a yeah and what the best part about adam sandler to me is i showed my kids like happy gilmore and they lost their minds like and it was so fun to see them just like freak out like like they've never seen jokes like that before um so you know, but you're, I'm always nervous. I talk about in the book, how I fuck up my interactions at all times. Well, that I, you do I, with, with celebrity, but like, I mean, like I'm yeah. talking about in a working environment, but that was one of my favorite parts because I re like, that is so me as well of like, you went up to Robert Downey Jr. Who you, oh. somebody you worked with said, I am a big, you know, like I know him, you should, he would love you. So you were at like comic con with him and you were like, RDJ, what's up, buddy. I was and like, he was like, he, had no clue who you were talking no about. No clue for like, I, I am at one point going to like, I, there are certain things I put in the book that I was like, this is the best version of that story that <laughs> to a, to a, a lay person, I could tell you here that I can flush that story out a little bit more. And I'm still trying to find the answers out here because I I'm getting closer and closer to it. Um, this person I know for a fact was with Robert Denny Jr. A lot. I, I know that he was with Robert Denny Jr. A lot because he knew people that you would never know like there is a yeah. one of my favorite older producers Stuart Kornfeld he is since he, red hour but he's red ben yes Stiller's I mean yes. a giant yes one of the best one of the I think uh, Stuart Kornfeld's claim to fame in many respects besides being a brilliant uh just fan and uh, producer was that he worked for Mel Brooks and he introduced Mel Brooks to David Lynch. And he said, Mel Brooks, you need to make a racer head. Like Mel Brooks film made a racer head, right? So it's just like he connected, like so Stuart Kornfeld, you know, we're again, we're the nerds. We're in this inner group, you know who I is. But like this guy's talking about hanging out with Stuart Kornfeld on Tropic Thunder. And I'm like, well, this guy's not lying because yeah. no one's talking about no, Stuart Kornfeld. Nobody's names dropping Stuart Kornfeld. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and um, and so you know. Over weeks and months, we had talked, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I want to go visit RDJ on this thing. I want to go here." And 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 so I'm like, "This is not a, an acquaintance of RDJ. This is like, oh, if I wasn't here, I would be with RDJ. Like that's, I, I am on loan to you." There's a part of the story I can't even tell that even makes it more. I, there, like, I, there are certain things I could say, but I will just say that there is no doubt in my mind that these two guys were connected so i'm like i get this moment to talk to rdj uh which is even super that i called him rdj and i was like hey man i know I, you know i know blank and he looked at me like i was a fucking alien and i i was like uh, and i and then i start just laying out these specifics he knows Stuart cornfield he looks like this he did blank he did blank i have I have fa like I'm like because I'm like all right maybe I messed it up I'm bad with names 
am I misremembering yeah. his name? I couldn't though, because I knew his name. <laughs> But I was like, I'm desperately trying to like climb up this mountain of Robert Downey Jr. Because now I just want him to believe me that I'm not an insane person. Like I'm not trying to start a fake conversation. Like I was sent here by him. He told me to talk to you. Now I'm here talking to you and you don't know who he is. Like I'm not, I don't want to be here. And my wife, meanwhile, who was already in Zodiac, was holding my hand, releases my hand, walks away from me. I'm like, you have the connection. She's like, she like Homer Simpsons it into bushes. Meanwhile, Robert Downey Jr.'s faded <laughs> bodyguards look at me. Their necks are the size of my thigh. You know, they're like, oh, should we, you know, RDJ, should we beat the shit out of this guy? I'm like, no, I, I don't. You know, but we can't move because we're waiting in front of a fucking <laughs> elevator that won't open. And I'm like sweating bullets. And I'm like, I, 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 I think I, I got you confused with somebody else. I've now like laid out a case. It's like it would be like me like having a like running a trial and at the end going, oh, wait, John Smith? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm defending the wrong person. I I was, yeah. it, it, and I felt like such. Yeah, wait, didn't you say to him like, oh, maybe it's yeah. not you. Yeah, maybe, like, it's, maybe not it's not you. Maybe, maybe it's, it's a, maybe it's uh, your dad, uh, Robert Downey Sr. I don't know. Like, who did I mistake? Who could I have mistook Robert Downey Jr. for? And there, and I'm the like, funny thing and is watching that guy that we've grown up watching his films. Like when he gives you a quizzical look, you're like, holy shit, that's Robert Downey Jr. giving a quizzical look. Ryan. I swear to God, again, I put different things in this book. I took it out, I put it in, I put it out. I, I took it out only because it was too deep of a, 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 a road to go down. If you watch Iron Man 3, there is a scene uh, with Guy Pierce meeting Tony Stark. I am convinced that Robert Denny Jr. said, I once had this interaction with uh, somebody. That this is how we should play the scene because that scene is. <laughs> I watched it and I was like, "That's me. That's what happened." <laughs> like, if you watch that scene, that is one million percent oh, my interaction with him, and I, it, it it curdles my stomach because I'm like, I think he fucking remembered it. So then, <laughs> when I got on set of Infinity War to visit some of my friends, I you know I knew Karen Gillan and Chris Pratt and a handful of other people, Paul Rudd. I'm on set and I'm just hanging out on this big day where they're shooting on this asteroid and i'm having like i'm having the time of my life i'm a total nerd i love this shit and he walked on set and he clocked me and i felt it i felt it like i remember that guy i don't like that guy and i may have based a, a moment in a movie w about that guy and i left i left the set i left i had carte blanche i was hanging with the russo brothers in video village and like peace guys i'm out like i can't be here because this energy is not good for anyone. That saved the Russo brothers from having an awkward conversation with you about like, yes, you, you got to go, bud. Like it's RDJ's I will not pull happening. that. I will pull that ripcord at any, I think, but also I have a feeling like he, but there's a potential. He was messing with you that he knew exactly who that guy was. Like you said, like that he just yes. likes to sometimes mess with. Cause there was one time uh, by speaking of Tropic Thunder, I used to work at this spa called Burke Williams, uh, oh, like yeah. sunset. Yeah. And I, I would behind the front desk and Justin Thoreau came in back in the day when he just did Lost Highway. Okay, and he perfect. was with Nancy Javonin, who now is married to Jimmy uh, Fallon. And okay, they yes, were together. Right. And I just, like, she was working for Drew Barrymore and we had been friendly, but I said, I really loved your work in Lost Highway. And he acted like he didn't know who, what I was talking about, who he was. And you could tell Nancy was kind of embarrassed that she he was doing this to me. But I was like, yeah, listen, I'm like a film geek. There's no I, right, like, lost I know highway. You're you not are. like going like, yeah, yeah like, at this point he wasn't like, you know, he was just coming up and I thought, man, I was like, that's so weird. And I was like, he knows he's Justin Thoreau. I got to tell you, once a dick, always a dick. I think that fame only brings out the worst in people. I've watched people who were awful before fame that just get the, uh, the success of fame and they're like, oh, I can just be a dick now professionally. But they're like, I, I saw one thing. I'm not saying this guy's a dick. But um, it was uh, Orlando Jones, very funny comedian. Um, my ex-girlfriend used to do um, junkets. Like, you know, she'd go to yeah. a hotel on a weekend, interview the whole cast and talk about everything. And, uh, you know, she sits down with Orlando Jones. They're talking about the, uh, the movie that she's interviewing him for and then kind of makes a comment like, oh, and, and you're the uh, – and, you know, and, of course, all the 7-Up commercials you've been doing. Because he did – like, he was like the 7-Up uh, spokesman. Yeah. And he's like, what? And she's like, you know, you're the spokesman for Seven Up. He's like, that's not me. He's like, it is. It is. Like, it's so weird. It's like, why do you do this? Where everyone's just trying to do their jobs. Everyone's just trying to be nice. Like, why are we? Why are we making it complicated for each other? Well, 
you you bring up like being a like you know like you know once a dick always a dick and like but I will say like when you kind of get in this fame bubble and you meet all of these people that you grew up watching and stuff like that have you had to ever check yourself of like getting too cocky because my first question originally was going to be like what is it like now for you to be the person that somebody wants an autograph from like some kid is going to recognize I, you or it happens I, all the time I'm sure I am always super gracious because first of all like it's lovely. I, I have amazing run-ins with people. They're great. The only thing I won't do, and some guy gave me grief about it, and I'm still having like an issue about it because this is, I think I'm overly a nice guy, uh, is that like sometimes people will give you like 15 headshots. Like, can you sign these? I'm like, I'll <laughs> sign two. Like, I'm not going to sign 15. Plus, what are, you, what, are you, what are you selling these for? Like, you know, it's like, like, <laughs> like, I, like, I, like to me, I'm like, don't hand me a stack of headshots. Like, I'm like, I'll sign two. Find me again. I'll sign two more. But I'm not gonna like, like or or they um give you a blank, uh, a, a blank piece of photo paper. So yeah. then you sign. They could print whatever the fuck they want on that. You know. So it's like I'm I'm always like a little like hesitant with that. That's the only time. But it, like, but for ninety percent of the time, uh, I will uh, I will be great. Uh, there's been some moments. Uh, that scare my children, which is always, oh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and that's, that's the other thing too. Like, I remember when I first had my, my kids, they were very young and I was holding them a lot and people would be like, Hey, can you sign this? I'm like, well, now I am carrying my baby. Like, they, like, I, like for me to put my baby on the ground to then sign, like that, those are moments where I would, where I would. <laughs> Listen, you have an experience in the book where you're having to get gas with a newborn oh, and you're I, like I freaking out this. trying to get home. Like you're putting a shirt on. Like it's wild. I mean, but I'll tell you this much. This is like, look, you, you want to know. I mean, I'll show you right here. Uh, this is I, I for everyone who is pre-ordering my book. I uh, I made a decision to make uh, personalized postcards. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm going to write you a personalized postcard if you pre-order my book and you go to my website and you sign up. And I, at first it's like, you know, I'll do it for the, the first like 1,000 people who buy the book. That would be nice. I was like, ah, 1,000 small. I, I should do it for the first 2,000. I was like, ah, well, 2,000 small. I'll do it for the first 3,000. God, I did not understand what that was like. And I am just signing postcards. This is like a chunk of them right here. Uh, I'm like in the- you I'm in the a picture of you at the, I think on an airport floor, just signing oh, postcards. Yeah, I'm just ready to go. And it's like, and I'm, I'm personalizing it too. It, it, is, it is personalized to you. Uh, and it's got a little fun fact about us together, uh, which these are mistakes. But I did, um, I did go to uh, J.C. Penny and, oh, uh, and take special pictures with my book. Glory, yeah, yeah. Try to beat that AI. There's yeah, no way. So there you go. But, um, um, but yeah. So I try to, you know, I look. I understand that people, you know, money's tight, and I want to make sure people have a nice. Uh, no, experience. that's what we we love about you. Uh, but by the way, you would it. actually also. Sorry, I'm not. You, yeah, no. you would also like because uh, you've read the book. Um, I'm making this part of my website where I'm putting up like the DVD special features of my book clips and photos and stuff like that. So you get a full experience. So now I got to get you into that, uh, that area. Yeah, guys, kind of Paul see uh, cool. has like, you can sign up to, for his sub stack. You can say, I'll have all that information in the yeah. show notes. I just, but it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun with just finding all these old things. Like I found that performance of that crazy, uh, I talk about like this acting performance, like this terrible, like, um, limerick based <laughs> acting yeah. show I was in. I um, have it. I got it all. Uh, speaking of autographs though, you have these, I mean, many great run-ins, especially as a kid and just yeah. two quick ones that, Please. you know, just like the highs and the lows of autograph seeking as a kid, you had a trip to, uh, well, for the high, you had a trip to Los Angeles. I, I don't think it was maybe with your grandfather or your yeah. dad. And you had like, you could pay for like where they were shooting like films and TV and you went around, got to see all of these productions. You were going in every area of town. And then there was one that was shooting interior, which was the movie communion, I believe yes. Yes. with Christopher Walken. And you were like an eight year old kid, right? I was like an eight year old kid. We were out here in California and this thing, I just want to like highlight this because it's one of the coolest things I ever did. Hollywood on location was you paid 75 bucks and you could go anywhere it. and meet anywhere. It was like the coolest thing, like, right. You could, like just to go to sets and know what you're shooting. And so meeting Christopher Walken, I was told I could meet this guy who at that point I only knew as like the bad guy from V to a kill, James, James. which was awesome. Like that's yeah. all I needed to know. And, uh, you know, Roger Moore was my James Bond for many a year. And, uh, and they're like, you can go in and meet him, but no camera, no parents. So I had to like leave my dad out on the street and I went across the street into this empty warehouse that was completely dark. They closed the door behind just like a sliver of light is in. 
And then in comes Christopher Walken, who, you know, is like, hello, little man. Uh, you know, and he's like, his hair is slicked back. He's got like eye contacts in, makes him look fucking insane. And I'm like talking to him. And I, like, so I'm expecting, you know, Max Zorin. And all of a sudden, I have this like, you know, he looks insane in that movie talking to me about aliens. I'm not saying a word. I basically passed my autograph book to him, which was, and I didn't know how to get this into the book, um, pharmaceutical. Like my dad is a pharmacist. And so he'd always have these like notebooks that were like um like ads for pills. And it literally was like Vi- a Vicodin. Uh pr- like I I I think I, I may even have it here because I just scanned it into my computer. Like I have Christopher Walken signing a Vicodin script. It's like, oh yeah, this is it. Oh well, this is like this I can show you this. This is um that's Vicodin and that's Marky Post's autograph on the Vicodin. <laughs> Thing. All right. So, you know, so yeah, so I, I met Christopher Walken. He's signing this, like, literally, like, like what is this? I mean, I, I, there's another run in that I had where I, um, my girlfriend at the time, her dad, like, Kukla Fran and Ali, it was kind of like an old school, like, Mr. Rogers meets, like, uh, Sherry and Lamb Chop, kind of a puppet live action show. And, um, I was walking down the street and I saw this, uh, Kukla Fran and Ali, uh, vinyl. And I was like, ooh, I'm going to buy that. That'd be a fun, like, little thing I can give her dad, like, make some brownie points. And I grab, I grab it on the street. And as I'm walking home, I literally bump into Harrison Ford. And Harrison Ford is, like, surrounded by uh, Indiana Jones merch, Han Solo merch. Everyone's trying to get his autograph because his trailer is, like, on the street. Um, and I, like, I, 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 like, go over the, you know, over the, the hood with, like, this Kukla Fran and Ollie album. And he looks, he grabs it. He looks at it and goes, it's weird. And then signs it. So I have an autographed <laughs> Kukla Fran and Ollie album. Harrison Ford signed a Kukla Fran and Ollie album. Uh, uh, but, so all, yeah, no. but you don't always have good stories because you have this no. like heartbreaking story with Alan Alda oh, as a yeah. kid as well that I think your grandma sent you over to a table where he was dining yes. with a couple of friends. And, you know, you even make the point like MASH was that kind of filler show that you would like yeah. watch your sitcoms and then you would have to put up with MASH sometimes as a kid. Yeah, I do I, look, look, I, and look, as an adult, I don't like MASH. Uh, but I do like Alan Alda. I do like, I think Alan yeah. Alda is great. Uh, MASH has never won me over. I, even the movie. Uh, I'm sorry, Robert Altman. Uh, but the, uh, but you know, so my grandma forced me to go. I, I, I didn't tell that Harrison Ford story because that's actually a good interaction. Ultimately. Yeah. These are terrible ones. And yeah, so my grandma forced me to go over to talk to Alan Alda, who I didn't really care for at that point. I, again, I, I'm a, you know, I'm a young kid. I, I shouldn't have a, a huge fascination with Alan Alda. You yeah. know, like, I mean, I think Alan that was Alda's a, like, I get this all the time, kid. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I approach his table. He's mid conversation. I understand at least if I'm going to approach a celebrity, I'm going to wait until there's a lull on the conversation and I'm standing behind his shoulder and there is no lull and I, it's going longer and longer. And then like, you know, some of the people at the table are like, Oh, well, and I think somebody wants to talk to you. You know, I'm like, and I'm like, Oh, Mr. Aldo, can I have your autograph? And he was like, no, I'm like what? I never had you that. No, it was like, no. And I was like, Oh, and he's like, you don't even know who I am kid. And I'm like, what do you mean? I know. We, I, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, you're from mash. But that was it. I had nothing else. And he's like, all right, name, name two other things that was in. And I was like, uh, you know, he got me. He, he called my bluff. He knew. I do believe that Alan Alda felt the prying eyes of my grandma and her whole table of yeah. bridge friends over there. And, and he was like, he was kind of serving my grandma, but using me as the, the bait. So he wouldn't sign this thing. I'm sitting there like struggling. And, you know, and he didn't do that thing. He didn't do that. Like what you, you know, like he didn't do that pressure release where he's like, all right, fuck it. I'll sign it for you. Yeah. 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 He's like, he's, he's like, no. go. And I had to walk back dejectedly to this table uh, with a no Alan Alda, uh, Alda autograph. And my grandma and her friends just laughing like, ah, oh, you got slammed. I'm like, I didn't even want to go over there. This is like, <laughs> this is my issue. I don't want to talk to these people. Like, I don't want, like, I, and that's, that's my new MO is like, I only speak when spoken to, you know, um, it was so funny. I just did, um, I had just done, uh, Twisters, the new movie Twisters, right? Yes. And all uh, right, so I was in Glenn Oklahoma. We're, Gl- it's yeah, Glenn Powell, twisters. great. I love Glenn Powell, and I was a fan, obviously Top Gun. I, this is before, um, you know, uh, anyone but you had come out, and so I was like, I'm coming in for a day. That the director had seen me on a plane going to Oklahoma, and uh, he was like, "Can you, you know, can you do a part in this movie?" And I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." And I'm just thinking, like, it, that's the worst thing to do. Uh, not the worst thing, but like when you come in to be a day player on a movie, it's really hard because 
no one knows you. No one cares to know you. Like you're, you're in and you're out. You're, it's a temp job, right? Like it, no matter how funny, no matter whatever it is, it's like, unless you're like, Oh, Brad Pitt's coming today. No one wants to talk to you. Like it's like, we don't give a shit about you. Like we got our own thing over. It's like, Oh, my daughter brought her friend from algebra class. Like that, that's the energy that you get when you're like a day player. So I, you know, I, I was nervous. Um, and I was like, you know, I'm just gonna go in. It's a funny scene. I'll, I'll just do it and go. And I get this phone call. Glenn Powell just calls me up and says, hey, man, what's up? So psyched. This is like before I shoot. Like, this is like the Saturday before I shoot. And he's like, just psyched you're going to do the movie. I want to talk about it. And I'm like, and I'm like, oh, fuck. I don't want to fuck this up. Like, I was like, yeah, okay, great. Like, I don't like, I don't want, like, now is too much pressure. I didn't want to like, because it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to let people down. I don't want to, like, I don't know. I don't know where to draw this line. I'd rather just come in, keep my head down. And people are like, you know, they walk away. He was quiet, but he was nice. You know, like, and instead of like, oh, he was way too friendly. Uh, and well, sure, uh, it was so know. mysterious. Yeah, I would rather be mysterious. But I know it's, a, a, you know, you just want to be. I, I, I sometimes find that chummy, chummy stuff. Um, like, it gives me the weirdness. So, you know, where it's like, I don't want to yeah. be like, hey, buddy. Oh, hey, what's going on? Like, it's like, eh, you know, I know how I am. I like, we'd have guest stars come on the league. And, you know, and they're like, wow, you guys are so quiet. And we're like, oh, yeah, because we've been doing this for five and a half years. Like, you know, like we just yeah. go back to our chairs. You know, it's like, I understand you're working. You want to sit and you're like, you know, or whatever. You got other things going on. I never want to be a problem. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm always nervous. I just like, oh, God, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. The, the human interaction. I'm less worried about like, yeah. the, the acting of the it. Acting. <laughs> I, just wanna, <laughs> I don't want to mess up like anything like that. Like I was, I geeked out because on Twisters, I was like, Dan Mandel is the cinematographer. And I was like, Dan Mandel, I'm a huge fan. And I felt like he was like, what? Why are you? Like, it was like, I was like, I, you know, like, you know, like I'm the, probably the first person to come up to him. He was like, oh, you're shooting on film. Can you tell me? He's like, I'm not talking to you. You're in this movie for one fucking day. Get out of here. You know? Like, but again, I messed up. I was like, oh, damn, Mandel will at least appreciate that. I appreciate he's a cinematographer. You just weirded out. He was like, yeah. Never I'm going win. up to key grips. Like, you're my favorite no. key grip. This is amazing. Um, but I got to take lessons from Glenn Powell because Glenn Powell, man, he is uh, oh. charming as hell. Just get, the fact that I've never gotten a call from a from an actor in a movie to be like, hey, I'm psyched for our scene. Let's let's talk about it. If you want to talk about it, like I'm here. N never has that ever happened. And I was like, this I guy. Was, I was in acting class with that dude like decades ago, and I, I he was like he had this like just aura about him where he would just show up to a movie lot and he would just get on and he would just plop himself in front of a door and he would just make conversations with anybody. And I was like, were you scared? He's like, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'm there. Like he just had this attitude of like, no man, this is what I want to do. And it wasn't, it wasn't douchey. It wasn't no, like he really believed, like it made me believe in like old school Hollywood stuff. Not, not necessarily Tom Cruise, but Tom Cruise esque of like, well, we are here for the magic of cinema. You know, there is something that's really great. Like what I think he carries is like, a more accessible McConaughey energy. Like, and by, by the way, I love McConaughey. McConaughey is like, you're like, whoa, boo, dude, like, whatever. You're playing your bongo drums. You're, you're going to be talking about something. I'm going to be like, yes, I was with you for the first four minutes and now I'm lost and God bless you. <laughs> but like, you know, like he's just like, we were, you know, we were talking about like, I was like, man, I'm so psyched that you're doing any, uh, anyone with you. Cause it's like, I love set it up. Uh, that, that rom-com that was yep. on Netflix. I was like, I was great movie. I feel like people don't know about that movie. I mean, I think people do, but it's like, it's just a solid rom-com. I was in long shot, which I think is a, a fantastic rom-com. So good. That movie, like so Seth good. Seth Rogen, Charlize Theron, like you guys, it's so it's on Netflix right now, I think. Yeah. And it was like, and so, and you know, I was saying, I was like, when you can actually make like a rom-com that can like elevate and be really like, where, this is before the movie came out. I was just like, I, you know, it's like, it's, I mean, look, he's doing it right. I mean, he's figured, I mean, that movie, did it right in every which way. But it's like, I think that sometimes people poo poo a rom-com and when you do it well, it's like people, I mean, I just know it from the long shot love and I see it with June. Cause you know, I just have a small little part in that, but June, you know, she sees it all the time and it's like, you put funny people in and it is, it is part of it is like, the charm of those, you just want to hang out with those people. It's and, a hangout. And those movies last so much, like those movies that they last forever. Like people, oh, will, yeah. like those are the ones that get on like TBS and you're like, I'll watch it with commercials. Um, I know we're almost running out of time yeah. here. Uh, so to wind down to, I just wanted to talk about your relationship with your wife because yeah. I thought it was so amazing. Uh, you know, you, you were in the same circles in New York and there was this thing of you guys bumping into each other. There was a date that did not happen. Yes. Um, and then you wound up like at like some like other party, but then you went 
dancing. And I'm curious because there's a guy that comes up to you while you're dancing and you think there's like still a shot with June. Yeah. And he's like, she likes you just as a friend. And oh. lay, by the way, I mean, obviously everything worked out well, but did you ever find out what he actually, did she say something at the yes. beginning of that so, date? Like, so here's the thing again, what I put in the book, what I didn't put in the book. I was like, the story ends in a better way than me going. And eh. I, I was going to actually add like an addendum to that chapter and go like, do you want to know here? And it's almost like the end of clue. Like, and you want to know what really happened. So, <laughs> you know, June and I, um, we're kind of floating around each other for about a year. Um, we had both gotten out of long-term relationships. We both had been dating other people, but we had this kind of like pull, like we would see each other. We weren't in the same friend group. So every now and then we'd kind of find each other and hang out for a long time and then go away and then see each other again. And there was just something there. And I was trying to be like, I think there is something here. We're not like, there's a difference between like friends and flirting right now, or at least I thought I knew that difference. And I was like, I'm going to try to make my shot and 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 see if there is something here because I, I i feel like there is so we we go out on a real date now our friends one of my friends and and one of june's friends were actually dating too and they were like they heard that we were going out and they're like we'll meet up with you and it was kind of like a perfect thing it was like okay they put a little less pressure on our date we could have yeah. dinner together then we'll go meet up with them but they decided to meet up with us uh, at dinner and it, all of a sudden our ro nice romantic date which you know i'm like this is going great gets just upended and, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is going well though. I think that she likes me and we go out and my friend pulls me to the side at the end of the night and goes, oh, she doesn't like you. And I, like you said, I'm a heartbroken and, and little do I know that my friend and her friend were trying to protect us both. So they were trying oh. to figure out like, what does he like her? Well, I don't know. Does she like him? Like this kind of like. They were playing cat and mouse with each other, and they both spooked each other. So my friend's like, no, no, he just likes her as a friend. And then her friend was like, yeah, she just likes him as a friend. So they kind of made the decision for us that we liked each other as a friend. So I, that night, am told that she just likes me as a friend. I'm kind of spiraling. I'm like, fuck, I thought I missed, I read these signs right. And, you know, and we, and the, but then when she comes back out of the bathroom, she's still flirty and it's still fun. And I'm like, okay, this is weird. Like, why is she so flirty? If she just <laughs> likes me as a friend I'm going with, it. I'm not questioning it. Uh, and we kiss that night for the first time. And, and I'm like, it's so great. You were like, you were like, Oh my God, is, uh, is this normal? Like, is this yeah, how like, is this like, like you, a friend you still thing? don't even really know at that point. No. And so I'm like freaking out. So I go away totally confused. Now June and her friend, they go away to do like a little, um, retreat together. And on that retreat, her friend says, oh, by the way, that guy only likes you as a friend. So now, I, so she finds out days later, I find out the night of. So now she's away and going like, what? And I'm over here going, what? And we are like, we can't get to each other to find out what the real thing is. So we both were like lied to. And then we were able, like not lied to, but protected. Uh, by our friends who were trying to do us a, a solid, and uh, and then I finally just kind of made a, a more solid move. I, I put my I put my neck out on the line and was like, "I like you. Do you like me?" I was also drunk, so that's why it was so monosyllabic. Yeah. And uh, and she, uh, you know, she said yes, and then the rest is history. God, that could have been a really good Back to the F Future sequel if you guys oh didn't wind up together that I night. Know. I mean, imagine all of this stuff that couldn't. Anyways, uh, you guys, there are so many things that I didn't even get to touch on, but that's how good this book is. is oh, that you're there so, are so lovely. Many Thank stories you. you're going to like actually relate to. It's going to like, I sat there and thought about my own life. You know, he even opens with like collecting memories and now he put like puts them in these canisters and like cracks me up because like I have Mardi Gras beads that I don't like, I know, but like, how would I like if right. I ever have a kid, them junk to somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, just... one of the best things I ever found, I, I like I talk about like going through, I've had people who in my life who've passed and you go through their stuff. And the best thing I've ever found, one of the most conservative, nice guys I know, uh, older man now passed away. I found a card to the nudist club of New York. And I was like, Perfect. this is amazing. <laughs> and I need to know this story. And I will never know. <laughs> that's fair. No, that's the mystery of life. Also, the the June story cracks me up because you mentioned working on Best Week Ever, which yeah. that's where I first just, like met you. Oh my gosh! And I just like to me when I watched Best Week Ever, I was like, that dude, they're all millionaires, dude. They're like oh. to me that was like the height of comedy, and I would just sit there on. I think I watched it on Saturday mornings, and I just like I would just laugh hysterically, and it's just so funny. Like that was like another job for you, but I loved Best Week Ever. 
To me, best week ever, um, and first of all, I love that you know it's best week ever. Most people go, oh, you're from those, I love the 80s shows. And I'm like, and I take some pride in best week ever because best week ever was a little different because we were like the Twitter before Twitter. We were like, we were pop culture cliff notes of the week that was. The first episode of best week ever, we had a party planned. It was going to be like this premiere party. And that afternoon, J-Lo and Ben broke up. That's how long ago it was, right? And it was a stop the presses moment of like, <laughs> we need to get back in the studio. And we like ran in to like record this section to be able to talk about that. And that was like the benefit of that show because we were shooting in an office building. It was easy enough to load in the machine and go. Um, and that was what was so fun about it. It was like it was like Survivor finale happens on Wednesday. And on Friday, we're talking about it. We're breaking it down. Like yeah. Before there were Vulture and all these great websites and you know, TikToks and everything. We were that, that voice, um, which is so much fun. And it was, you know, so I, I do take a pride in that, you know, and look, I love everybody talked about the eighties and the nineties, but we were doing, we, we were like, oh, we were I mean, like kind of more of a, uh, you know, we were kind of the news, the news of pop culture. Yes. I'm, I'm wistful for those days, but you guys, yeah. you need to get this book. Like, I'm not even joking. This so is something much. that I I'm personally invested in at this point. Once again, it. this is called Joyful Recollections of Trauma. Now, of course, he has his podcast, How Did This Get Made, Unspooled, PaulShear.com, everything, because this man does it all. He also has one of the best cameras that ever, like, on, on terms of, I sometimes will watch you your videos. You look great, no, the, you're you're on another level. I'll watch sometimes any of your videos. Like, what the hell is this guy? The the you lighting. Know, it was just one of those things where, like, we were in this, uh, you know, pandemic, and I was like, why am I holding back? Why am I? Why am I uh, like not investing good money in like a nice camera? And then I found out I didn't even have to invest that much good money in it. Just a camera and a lens. <laughs> um, but by the way, I just want to I want to throw you some uh, some uh, some compliments as well. Um, you made a video that, uh, we did on the show. We did faithful findings on the show a handful of years ago and you watched every Neil Breen movie in one day, right? Did you do that? Uh, or am I wrong on that? No, that's not me, but it seems like something. But oh. uh, it sounds like something I would do. I mean, maybe that maybe that's maybe, AI saying I did. Now something. maybe you do. Oh, maybe okay. Well, I I am well, a fan. I'll take the compliment. I I'll take, take the compliment. No, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Uh, yeah. No, they see. Now, now I feel like a jerk. You see, I've messed it up. I've messed it up right no, here. No, this you. is this is it. the magic of podcasting. <laughs> well, this is awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I loved uh, chatting with you. Uh, and just, I love chatting with you. Just I want the audience to hear this one thing that I think this is why this book actually stands out even more than podcasts and why he's meant for this. There's a great passage in, the, in this that says, if you want me to spell out what I've learned, it's that weakness isn't a deficit, that trust doesn't always lead to lies and rejection, that passivity and agreement are different, and that honesty isn't best administered in small doses, which I thought was just a beautifully written passage, oh, uh, Paul. Thanks. And then uh, finally, just to creep you out uh, about going up to people that you're nervous at, I was reading the thing about being tipsy going up to potentially Robert Downey Jr. And I was like, that sounds really familiar. And then I went back to Comic-Con pictures of 2015. And here's me and you. Whoa. At uh, some, I think it was Zachary Levi's party or oh, something Oh, yeah, like the best that. party at Comic-Con. Yeah. And I, I was that. hammered. So I, I mean, that's the best barely one. Barely recollected that. So, now, can I, uh, I just because I, I also know your show, I want to ask you, well, not the, not the, uh, the, the Breen thing, but, um, but I want to ask you a favor, uh, not a favor, just a gut check on you. Did you watch Traders, season two of Traders? Yeah, of course I did. Okay. I, I'm What's your I'm prediction for in three? Australia, you oh, oh, me too. All of Australia that. season Dude. two, one of the best endings of all time. Okay, don't we do? Uh, well, oh, uh, I'm only oh, okay. on Australia season one. I, oh, I'm, I will not with spoil three a thing. episodes from the end. How did you Oof. get season two? It's not on Peacock. Yet. I, f- I found it. VPN? Okay. I okay. mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I had to go deep to find that. And I was okay. very, a uh, Plex. Somebody hooked me up on Plex server. Okay. Uh, if I could figure out how to share it, I will share it with you. But I, um, it's great. It is. I mean, I'm in a trader's K hole right now. Like, we've oh. watched nothing but traders for the last week. I can keep on talking about it. I'm like, why? It's such a great show. But tell me. Just because I feel like you're in, you're the Vanderpump, so you have everything, you really, <laughs> yeah. who is, who do you think needs to go on? Because I was against U.S. traders. I watched UK, yeah. Australia, then I came to U.S. Second season of U.S., very good. Um, 
who do you think would be good? I have some thoughts on, on this too, but I wanted well, to see, know like US what you is think. so different because they are going for that reality show celebrity yes. driven thing. And then once I watched that first and I didn't realize how intense the gameplay was on all the, the other iterations. It's way better because it's which like, makes yeah. you appreciate it so much more. So then like, I still love the, the American traders. And I think Alan Cumming is giving a performance of a lifetime, but yes. I think what's great. Like I love seeing Trishel and uh, CT. I love when they pick from like real world road rules. Yes. I love those kind of things so you need to bring back some of these people obviously i think like spencer pratt and heidi would be uh they're really good i would love to see them on the show i think that would be a nice one you know who i think too it's a little bit out of the box but i think jerry o'connell would be a oh. great oh put him in the God. mix he's got that bravo connection but he's also really fun and i'm like him on there because what i noticed in the second season of the traders was like the bravo people don't know how to play the game so like there's no. a moment where I love it, where Phaedra is confronted by um uh oh my gosh Jan? uh no it was another Bravo a person it was right at the end she says to her she's like um I have oh, to ask Sheree. Her. Sheree. Sheree. Sheree, like, yeah. she wouldn't lie to me and I and I went and asked her are you a traitor I'm like <laughs> she can't she has to lie to you but they didn't understand the rules and no, like in that real like look at me tell me tell me are you and I thought that's what's so funny is that none of them went in doing their homework like Mercedes I'm friends with and Mercedes went to the very end yeah. and she's still mad she still oh, doesn't yeah. she's like listen they were they my fucked friends her over. Like, yeah, but that's the game. And CT fucked her over more than Trishel. Can you ask Mercedes a question the next time you talk to her? I think I'm going to see her because... tomorrow, actually. Yeah. Okay. Ask her about the smokers click. I have heard that the traders, there was like a smokers click. Everyone yeah, went out Sandra. to smoke. That's where there was a lot of I had, chat. Kate, I had Kate Chastain on the show last week. She says that's bullshit. She says okay. that's not true. Okay. That's not true. But she's she cracks up about everybody, especially the gameplay, like Sandra, the gamers and stuff like that, all the theories. It, you know, Kate said it wasn't that deep. Um, but I love I love that kind of intensity and passion. I mean, it is. It, I cannot wait for you to watch season two of Australian Traders. And then I'm all going to say I'm only going to say this. Um, one, I'm trying to be as vague as I can. If you watch Australia Trader season two, which was the last one because they cancel it, um, one of the final three they canceled it. They canceled it. I don't know why. It's amazing. It's the best one of all time. There was a um, clairvoyant in the first season. I. It, it gets it gets so much better. One of the final players. T email me and I'll tell you. You okay. have to look at their YouTube channel because they break down. The emotional, I mean, you do this with all the real people on your show, but I'm like, she's recording her own videos, breaking down an emotional uh, ending. And I, I love it. I'm so glad you brought up the traders. Uh, thank you. But thank you for all of this. I know I took so much of your time. I was really, man, thrilled to be this here. This was just made my whole month. So thanks, dude. You I can't awesome. wait to see the reception of this book. And uh, I, I know I don't know you, but I'm really proud of you. This is just really well, awesome, man. That means the world to me. Thank you so, so much. And uh, I'll talk to you I hope to, to bump soon. into you some other time besides Comic-Con down the uh, Yes, indeed. Please. And we can okay. talk about traders and Vanderpump. I can't wait. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.